Hi, I'm Cressel Anderson, this is Maker Size. In this episode, I'm gonna be going over my DIY mini split air conditioner installation. And I did this project entirely myself. I did not engage the services of professionals uh, to get this project completed. Now, I'm gonna be going over several different aspects of this project, including why I decided to go a DIY route. I'm gonna talk about sizing of the unit and selecting features. I'm gonna talk about the pre-installation legwork that I had to complete before I could even get started with the install, the actual installation process. I'm also gonna talk about a problem that I encountered and how I went about solving it. I've got a really detailed article on my website that goes through this entire process in more detail than I can fit in this video. First off, why did I decide to go the DIY route? This is maker size after all, so I like to exercise my inner maker. I haven't had the experience of working with air conditioning, although I feel comfortable with electrical, plumbing, and framing, those types of things. Air conditioning presents new opportunities to learn, and I value that. Cost uh, factored in uh, versus the hassle and expense of going out and finding somebody, getting quotes, arranging for them. I save money doing it myself. Lastly, it's legal in my area to do this installation myself. And that's kind of a good segue into why maybe a DIY installation is not for everybody. If you think you're gonna go through a process like this, you need to ask yourself several key questions. And in all these questions, if your answer is no, you shouldn't proceed. Uh, but what I would encourage you to do is figure out how to get those answers to be yes. Take some actions that allows you to answer yes to those questions. You know, I, I'm glad I went down this path. First off, is it legal in your jurisdiction? If it's not legal in your area, you shouldn't do it. This was the most involved DIY project I've ever completed. And so along those lines, if you doubt your skill set or your knowledge for completing a project like this, don't do it. If you're doing a mini split install in the United States, even as a homeowner, you need to be certified as a technician by the EPA. And this ensures that you have the training to not release refrigerants into the atmosphere. They can be bad or really bad for the environment. If you don't have that certification, you shouldn't undertake this project. Do you have concerns about invalidating your manufacturer's warranty? This is something I had to think through and consider my risk level and how comfortable I felt with it. I decided to proceed anyway, but if you do your research on a DIY mini split installation, you're gonna find that the manufacturer warranty support for amateur installation is definitely in the maybe category. Even for units that are marketed to DIY installation, you're gonna find that you know, a manufacturer may require you to bring in a professional to diagnose your system prior to honoring that warranty. So that's something to be aware of. The very first thing you're gonna do before you get started with any kind of installation is making sure that you have the right unit for your application. I used eComfort.com's online calculator and I also compared it with several other online tools for calculating the size of a system. And I primarily used that calculator because it had the ability to select garage as a room type. And I entered in the different insulation for ceiling and walls. And uh, one of the things that came out of that is I could tell that I would have to really oversize the system if I did not insulate the attic. So in a previous video, I took care of that. And then I ran through those calculations with excellent insulation in the attic. And it reduced the heating and cooling loads down to 6,000 BTUs per hour cooling load and 8,400 BTUs per hour for the heating load. As an input to the sizing calculators, I had to specify an indoor and outdoor design temperature for this application in both heating and cooling. For the cooling application, I selected an outdoor design temperature of 91 degrees Fahrenheit. Indoor design temperature, I can live with 75. For heating, I chose an outdoor design temperature of 22 degrees Fahrenheit, again, based on this geographic location, and indoor design temperature of 55. Now that's a little cold maybe, but uh, I can put on a jacket and I'm gonna be out here working, so that should make it even more comfortable. Primary limiting factor there is my slab is not insulated, so that's going to bring down the temperature despite the good insulation I've got in the attic. Once I determined that a 9,000 BTU per hour unit was appropriate for my installation, I needed to decide which unit. There's a lot of variations of mini split air conditioners for that size, 
And what was a distinguishing factor for me was efficiency. I want to maximize the efficiency of this unit, not necessarily for cost savings, but for energy reduction in an absolute sense. So that led me to the Sinville Aura series of air conditioners. And I selected it because of its high 25 SEER rating. That's, that's about the <laughs> highest that I could find. Uh, and it's also uh, got a very good performance characteristics in cold weather, uh, cooling much colder than what I would need in this area, down to even minus 17 Fahrenheit at reasonable efficiencies. I wanna say a special thanks to Sinville Air Conditioners for sponsoring this video. I did my research, I selected this unit, purchased it, installed it on my own before I ever reached out to Sinville as a sponsor for this video. And I'm happy with my decision. If you are contemplating installing a mini split air conditioner in your garage or in your home, uh, DIY or not, I think you would uh, do well to consider Sinville air conditioners and the Aura series uh, specifically for that application. There was some pre-installation legwork that I had to complete before I could even get started with the installation. First and foremost is the building permit. 100% legit because I paid the 50 bucks to make it legit. In the US, the EPA requires technicians who may release R410A into the atmosphere to be certified as technicians. There is no exclusion for homeowners doing a DIY mini split installation. After doing my homework online, I found a local HVAC supply house that proctors the EPA Section 608 Universal Certification Exam. I drove up and I purchased the study packet. I found the manual as well as the study aids in the packet very helpful. And not only for helping me pass the technician certification exam, but also for like providing real world application uh, examples that really did help me when it came time to installing the unit, such as uh, cooling a recovery cylinder during the recovery process. I returned about a week later to take that exam. I passed and with my technician certification in hand, I was proud that I'd done what I needed to to make my installation legit. Special thanks to Quick Products by Mainstream Engineering for sponsoring this video. If you're gonna get certified, you should consider the Quick 608 EPA kit from Quick Products or visit their website epatest.com for more info and other certifications. I'm glad I did. I followed the manufacturer's instructions for installing the outdoor unit as well as hanging the indoor unit and then I turned my attention to connecting the two. Now the most important of these connections is the line set. The line set is the pair of copper pipes that connect the indoor and outdoor unit and allow the refrigerant to make the complete cycle. The flare nut connections at the end of the line set are the most critical part of a DIY installation. And that's because if you're gonna have a leak, that's where it's gonna happen. The indoor unit is shipped from the factory pressurized with nitrogen, so you know it's not leaking. Well, there you go. The outdoor unit ships from the factory charged with the R410A refrigerant, so you know it's not leaking. If there's gonna be a leak in the system, I know that it's gonna be at those flare nut connections that I installed. So along those lines, if your manufacturer specifies a torque setting for those flare nuts, make sure that happens. If you use a crow's foot wrench along with a standard torque wrench, make sure you put it at 90 degrees so you don't have to do any kind of multiplication factor for the torque you've got dialed in on your torque wrench. Hanging the indoor unit was rather awkward and I ended up removing a section of drywall just to give me room to negotiate the line set, drain line, and electrical cable while I was hanging the indoor unit. It would be a lot easier to just drill a hole straight through to the exterior of the building, but in my case, I didn't want to have to manage the line set and cables on the outside. I would rather take care of that on the inside. With the line set connected, I went ahead and vacuumed down the system, or so I thought. Now this is where my project hit a pretty major snafu.
and uh, really it's only me to blame. I did not have the Schrader valve depressor installed in the end of my hose, so therefore that Schrader valve isolated my manifold and my vacuum pump from the system. So although I vacuumed it down and left it under vacuum for the manufacturer's specified time, I didn't actually vacuum the system. So when I released the refrigerant, I released it into an unevacuated line and contaminated the refrigerant with non-condensables and potentially moisture. I knew that I would have to recover the refrigerant from the system and uh, it wasn't the end of the world, but it was a kind of expensive mistake. I ended up having to buy a recovery unit, recovery cylinder, and a tank of Virgin R410A to fix the problem. For the recovery process, I took my recovery cylinder and vented the nitrogen that it comes pressurized with, and then I vacuumed it down to a 500 micron vacuum level. With the recovery cylinder empty, I took it in the recovery unit outside and I hooked it up to the system. I followed the instructions that came with the recovery unit to recover the refrigerant from the system. The manufacturer didn't specify a few things, such as a pressure test or vacuuming down to a particular micron level, but those are things that gave me a little extra peace of mind. So I ended up buying a nitrogen tank, regulator, and the micron gauge, and that added about 300 bucks to the cost of the project. That's the cost of my peace of mind. I took a cylinder of nitrogen and regulated it down to about 250 PSI, and then I pressurized the system with nitrogen. I left that nitrogen overnight just to make sure that it didn't bleed down. You wouldn't have to wait overnight if you have digital gauges. After I was convinced that the system wouldn't leak, I did a triple evacuation, and that's basically where you take the system down into vacuum, you break the vacuum with nitrogen, you do that again three times, and that's supposed to get everything out. After I did the triple evacuation, I went ahead and pulled it down to the final evacuation level. And while the vacuum pump was working, I went ahead and took care of the electrical parts of the installation. I wired up the outside to the disconnect, ran the Romex back from the disconnect to the breaker panel. I eventually got the system down to about 1300 micron and I felt like that was an acceptable level because I don't have a vacuum rated manifold gauge and I'm using smaller diameter hoses. So at this point, I was very confident that the system wouldn't leak and that it was ready to charge with Virgin R410A. I inverted the R410A tank and that way the liquid at the bottom of the tank is what's forced into the system. With the tank inverted and the hoses connected, I put it on the scale and got a baseline weight of 15.31 kilograms and factoring in the addition of 1.5 kilograms to charge the system, I knew that my target was 13.81 kilograms. I slowly opened the valve and let the refrigerant flow into the system, monitoring carefully the weight of the tank plus the hoses. At around 13.86 kilograms, the transfer rate slowed to almost stall out. So I very gingerly warmed the tank to create just enough of a pressure rise that I could transfer in that last little bit of refrigerant and I hit the target spot on. I was pretty happy with that. Now I put off making the connection in the electrical box until the very last step and with the system charged and ready to go, I went ahead and installed a two pole 15 amp breaker in my box 
And I turned it on and fired up the system for the first time. During operation, the system on that low pressure side will drop a little bit, and that's a good opportunity for me to disconnect my equipment from the system. I lost no refrigerant on this release, but probably, I don't know, maybe 100 grams when I took this one off. Definitely like these connectors. So I talked with Yellow Jacket, and although people do use them for this purpose, the manufacturer doesn't recommend using them with R410A. So I did a little bit of research, and uh, I think maybe what I would do if I were gonna do this project again, I would use the CD5060, and that is an adapter that has a built-in thumb-operated Schrader valve depressor, and I think that would kind of absolutely minimize the refrigerant lost when I was disconnecting uh, from the system. I'm really happy with the performance of this system. It's gotten up to about 95 degrees outside and I've been able to keep it at a comfortable 75 and even lower. Uh, I think I've got it down to as low as 67, but that's uncomfortable for me to work. Now it's not winter yet, so I haven't had the opportunity to uh, try out the heat pump operation, but I will update the article on my website with observations you know, in the future relative to this unit. The overall cost for the project was about $155 for other costs such as the building permit and my technician certification. Uh, equipment cost was $960. The mandatory tools I think was $281. The deluxe tools like the nitrogen tank, regulator, and micron gauge, uh, another $300. And to fix my problem, I ended up spending an extra 600 bucks. That brings the uh, total base cost to about $1,400. My end cost was about $2,300. So that's kind of the range that you might be looking at. So to finish up the installation, I replaced the drywall. I created out of some scrap wood a raceway to protect the line set and electrical cables. And I also used my 3D printer for probably the most useful application to date, I printed a hood uh, to prevent water intrusion in the exterior penetration of that line set through the side of the house. With the system all nice and tidy, I invited the county building inspector to come out and take a look and sign off on it. Does that get the overall? The overall, all right. <laughs> Before you undertake a project like this, you definitely need to check out that article on my website. It's got a lot of details that I just couldn't fit into this video. There's a link down in the description. I hope this project inspires you to exercise your inner maker. Thanks for watching.